Hi. So, um, this is things. Okay. Um, after the war. So, society during the war. Um, one of the most major changes brought on by the war was, um, planned economies where, like, a nation, like, channeled all of its resources into the war effort. So, like, pretty much everyone in their country, um supported their country um the countries exercised like wage controls and price controls and most people were willing to sacrifice for the war like think of america and suffragettes and stuff um men were drafted into the military women worked in the workforce um female nurses served at female nurses and doctors served at the front um but Great Britain was the only country to have a women's division of the military at this time, which is a thing I'm beginning to realize that I say a lot. Um, some people, however, did not go on with the whole nationalistic war effort because um, women gained a lot of independence. Um, they cut their hair short, they wore makeup, um, shorter skirts, they smoked and drank in public. Um, incomes for workers rose and there was more equality in the workforce so clearly there were some like more conservative people that did not appreciate that um, daylight savings time was used for the first time and um, out of all the nations you um, involved um, Germany had the most planned economy and the most advanced chemical industry so Germany was just the most strict with its policies involving war efforts and things um and before world war one um writers and just intellectuals in general had glorified war um we all know all quiet and just trench warfare in general and just warfare um this attitude changed throughout the war um there were english soldiers by the name of Sigfrid Sassoon and Wilfred Owen. Wait. Sassoon and Wilfred Owen. Um, they wrote poetry um, about irony and bitterness and stuff. And um, Sigmund Freud, um, he wrote about the war. Uh, he wrote about war as psychologically as a struggle between um, like more primal human drives and then civilized moral standards and then obviously the negative aspect won out in that. Um, there were other writers that um, basically just questioned Western civilization um, and its civility at all. Um, I'm, this is just like vocab stuff, but I'm going to give you the names anyway. Um, Oswald Spengler, who was German, he published the decline of the West, um, which analyzed like the cycle of civilization, just how it kept repeating and repeating. Um, and he saw 20, the 20th century as a decline in that cycle of Western culture. Um, Thomas Mann, um, he was also German. Um, he wrote something, the man, the magic mountain, um, and it was set in a tuberculosis sanitarium where patients debated the aspects of Western civilization. And finally, um, William Butler Yeats, who I'm sure we are all familiar with. Um, his poem, The Second Coming, was um, just implied the dawning of like a new negative age. So basically everyone was like, the earth, the history of the earth in like a kind of a Marxist way just is predictable and keeps repeating and right now the world sucks. Um, so yes, everyone, Western Europe emerged from the war like disillusioned and discouraged and they were not optimistic and faithful in progression and in industry like they were before. Um, now for the Treaty of Versailles and all the things that that involved. Um, so 27 nations were sent to talk about the peace stuff, except for obviously only four mattered. Um, and their representatives, I will tell you about them. But I'm sure we already know who these people are. Um, 
not the people, but the countries. Um, Britain, um, his, his, I keep referring to countries at, by him or her. Um, Britain's representative was Prime Minister David Lloyd George. Um, France's representative was George Clemenceau. Well, even though it's not George, that's a name that is French. I don't know how to pronounce. Um, Italy's was um, Vittorio Orlando. Um, even though that's not how Italians speak. And the United States's was Woodrow Wilson. Um, the conference began really optimistically with like faith in a new day and eternal peace. Eternal peace. Um, so Woodrow Wilson was like super, super, super idealistic. And he was a big deal. Um, he developed the 14 points um, as negotiating points even before the end of the war. Um, so they became demands at the conference of Versailles. So basically he was just like, I want things, so give me the things that I want. Um, the British and French were really harsh on Germany. Um, they thought that Germany should sign a war guilt clause and pay heavy indemnities. Um, basically the goal of the treaty that they're going to write was to make Germany incapable of aggression, which is ironic because we live right now. Um, so the British didn't want to discuss freeing the oceans. Um, Russia, nor any defeated nation, was not president. Was not, was not present, was not present at the time. Um, the, the new government of Germany, which was um, a republic, um, they didn't feel responsible for the war and they wanted to be heard and they wanted to be considered, of, like they wanted that point to be considered, but they were ignored. Um, and Wilson wanted the, the League of Nations to be established, um, which was the thing. Um, so consequences for Germany, um, one, they lost Alsace, Alsace-Lorraine, which is a thing that the French were pissed about before, if you watch my other video, um, and all of the colonies. Um, they took away, um, it, German territory was taken away to recreate Poland, because Poland is the answer to everything. Um, the German army would be limited to 100,000 troops. Um, they would be forbidden to make heavy artillery, aviation, or submarines, and then, yes, um, Turkey was reduced to a tiny peninsula. Hi, Daddy. Um, and its territory in the Middle East was divided into sections of England and France, so basically Turkey doesn't matter anymore because everyone took it over. Um, and the Zionists that wanted a Jewish homeland still, which is the only thing they wanted, they, um, they were ignored. And Austria was reduced into, like, teeny tiny. Um, and two new republics were created in Eastern Europe, um, Czechoslovakia, and the Kingdom of the Serbs, Croats, and Slovens, which was later called Yugoslavia. Um, so, France... No, okay. So basically, no one considered how much Germany would have to pay. They just knew it was a lot, and they were just kind of happy about that. Um, and the treaty contained a war guilt clause, which basically had Germany force to accept responsibility for the war, which I previously stated they did not think was theirs. Um, the Chinese at the conference, they tried to get um, foreign concessions and extraterritorial extra rights established in China, but no one listened to them either. And the Italians also were disappointed because they didn't get anything, basically, in the territorial rewards, but... I thought it was, like, something No, it's not food in the box. <laughs> um, yeah, so basically, the, all the Treaty of Versailles did was make people mad. Because Britain, France, Italy, and the U.S. just bullied everyone, so the people that got pissed off were the Germans, Italians, the Jews, the Chinese, the Turkish, and the Austrians, which, like, considering that we live in the 21st century, makes a lot of sense. World War II. Um, an aftermath of the war. Um, after the war, a really, really violent influenza swept across Europe, and as I stated before, killed more people than the war itself, which is saying something, because the war itself killed a lot of people. Um, actually, a people in America didn't really like the treaty. Um, 
there, um, there was a reaction against the war, the treaty, and Wilson's effort to establish the League of Nations. Um, the U.S. Senate became Republican, um, though Wilson was a Democrat, and they refused to ratify the treaty. Um, the United States never joined the League of Nations, and yep, so that's kind of a failure. Um, oh, finally, one of our last people that are important, um, John Maynard Keynes, or something like that, wrote um, the Economic Consequences of War, of the War. Um, he was an example of the people that were that thought it was a bad idea and wrote on it. Um, he was a British economist who argued that the conference um, that proposed, that imposed um, heavy indemnities on Germany was a mistake and would slow the post-war recovery of Europe. And he was right. The treaty was not successful because it was too hard to enforce. The Germans at the beginning didn't intend to follow it because they believed it was too dictated. The Allies were unwilling to enforce it and it was kind of a failure. The West was still terrified of Bolshevism, um, but since the war just happened, bye daddy, um, they were unwilling to engage in further fighting to stop Bolshevism, so that just became a bigger threat. Um, Japan kept expanding in China, and the like really, really unstable new governments in Europe were threatened by attempted revolts of the people. Um, economic recovery was slow, um, because economies were switching from wartime production to peacetime production, and all the soldiers were coming back to joining the war to join the workforce. Um, an eight-hour day became common, and the government, and so did government insurance against like accidents and illness, and stuff. Um, industrial nations, um, primarily Great Britain, found that the disruption of the war caused a loss of a lot of overseas markets because customers or whoever bought stuff from them, clearly Britain couldn't provide very much during the war, so they found other sources or developed their own production, so industrial nations, their economy went down, and um, yeah, so all this stuff, plus, plus overproduction and unemployment, created a post-war depression that lasted until the early 1920s, um, which all led to the post-war age of anxiety, and that is it. Oh, also, just, um, I'm not even going to go over between the wars, but, um, we all know that this leads to things like surrealism and, um, data or whatever, D-A-D-A -A art, um, with, like, realistic things and unrealistic setting, a lot of, like, weird psychological things, nihilism, existentialism, um, yeah, basically it's the lost generation because everyone is so psychologically traumatized by the events of World War One.